Well. <laughs> it's uh, Thursday, and on Thursday, we talk about age. On Thursdays, age is the adventure game engine, and uh, as advertised, we've got Malcolm Shepard with us today. Howdy. How a D. Um, while you're coming in, folks, uh, remember to give the, um, wherever you're at, whether it's Twitch or YouTube or Facebook, on Twitter, you really can only give it a heart and retweet it. But, uh, but do that. And then, uh, you know, share it with friends. Hey, Craig. Yeah, we also talk about aging, actually, Jeremiah. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's streaming in to our live stream. And, um, you know, I'm excited about today's show because I'm excited about all the Thursdays, just honestly, but this one in particular, because modern age is, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, you can choose from a vast, you know, uh, historical record um, and then tweak those to be future or steampunk or cyberpunk or, you know, uh, bronze age. Am I right? Bronze age? Um, it's a little, that's little fantasy age thing, but okay, you know, okay, maybe. Okay, um, <laughs> sure. you know, without further ado, first one I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say. Hello to you, my friend, Malcolm. So good to see you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, let's turn off that that future pop. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's it's catchy. Um, so here's the thing. I came to you just a, a couple of days ago and said, hey, you, would you mind um, popping in? Because, you know, normally we've got Owen uh, hanging out here. And, um, and you were like, absolutely. And we, as we often do, check in with each other early in the morning and say, mm -hmm. so what should we talk about today? And, you know, we wanted to kind of start from the beginning and create sort of a, a modern age encounter or at least begin the process. And through that sort of uh, uh, explore what modern age means, what are some of the ways that you can approach it. And, you know, when you've got a world of infinite choices, how do you narrow it down? And, uh, and what does the system provide, you know, what does the adventure game engine in the context of modern age allow for GMs to do for their table? Mm -hmm. Sound good? Yeah. Well, uh, I thought we would go like, we're going to really take kind of a big global view and sort of drill down from there. Love it. Because one of the things is, yeah, there are a lot of ways to play modern age and that's from the campaign or setting level on down. And, uh, that means a lot of potential games. So I guess the first thing I would say is you got to figure out exactly what world you're in um, and what your campaign is like. And uh, I have a few thoughts on that and a few thoughts on the kind of tools Modern Age has. Nice. So help out with that. So uh, the way we've kind of done Modern Age is, uh, is we have a core book that has a couple of default ways to play and a couple of suggestions. Uh, well, actually quite a few suggestions for running campaigns. Um, and then our kind of core supplements, which I would call the companion, enemies and allies, uh, and mastery, and then eventually powers when it comes out. Uh, those are kind of our, you know, core rules that don't depend on having a particular setting. Uh, and then we have a couple of books where, you know, there is a setting. So threefold is one of them. So threefold is sort of our default setting in a way, but kind of not. It's really, if you want to take everything in modern age and give it a common rationale and run a game with it, you can run threefold. And then, of course, we have um, World, of, World of Lazarus, which is a licensed setting and which is sort of a post cyberpunk, post cyberpunk setting, but with a very specific setup um, revolving around revived feudalism and um, and super powerful protagonists um, or less powerful ones. But the super powerful protagonists, the Lazari are right there. 
And um, so you have a couple of options there. And then we have sort of something new with Cyberpunk, which is uh, us providing a set of tools for a very specific genre, right? Without yeah. necessarily linking it to a setting. So there's a whole bunch of stuff to work with. Yeah. And I guess when it comes to devising a setting to play in, uh, one of the considerations is genre. And uh, because I think a, what a lot of people love about playing games is really imagining themselves in, in a world oh. that is informed by a certain genre and its aesthetics and its motifs and the things that kind of come out of it, right? Yeah. So if you want to play in a gothic horror game, you know, what you expect are crumbling mansions and, you know, maybe some vampires and ghosts, uh, family curses, that, that sort of thing, right? A lot of crushed so, velvet, I think, yeah. A lot of crushed velvet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> whereas, you know, if you want to do 1920s, 30s pulp, right, then you have a different set of associations that you want to build into things. So, um, but the genre choice uh, can kind of do two things for you. The first is look and feel, right? Which is a very big thing. Even if you're describing it in text or you're grabbing images off the internet, mm -hmm. um, you know, that stuff is still important. Um, the second thing is, of course, to serve as a source for potential stories. Because when I talk about, say, the fact that a lot of Gothic stories have family curses and ghosts and things like that, yeah. Those are all areas that you can build off of for specific stories, right? But where it all comes down to is, is thinking of what the overarching or recurring conflict is going to be in your setting, right? Because that's the thing or your campaign, right? Because you can have a setting that is very, very broad in scope and run multiple campaigns that are, you know, that have unrelated themes, in them, if you like. Uh, yeah. Right. But the main thing is uh, the setting has to generate some kind of conflict that will sustain play over a bunch of sessions and a bunch of adventures. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, uh, if you are, you know, running a Cold War espionage game, right, you have the inbuilt conflict, right? Because it's going to be the conflict between the major powers in the Cold War, right? Between the US and the USSR. Um, so that's going to keep generating uh, missions and complications and allies and villains and all of those things, right? So the setting is an engine that generates, um, that has a central conflict or a central set of conflicts that keeps generating these little conflicts. Yeah. Right. Um, so after you've done all of that, then you can kind of see how it hashes out in an actual adventure or session. Um, and for that kind of thing, well, in age, we kind of have our three channels of activity in play. And uh, those are, and they're right there in the Modern Age core book, uh, that's action, exploration, and social, right? So these are encounter types. Um, and one of the things that you can actually do is you can select one of those encounter types and you can upgrade it to kind of a dominant theme that applies to multiple encounters to an entire adventure. So, um, for example, uh, the adventure at the back of the Modern Age core book, it takes place at, at a party. So really, there are a bunch of different encounter types in it, but the sort of uh, lead encounter types in that case are going to be exploration and social, right? Because you're going to want to find out information and that involves social maneuvering um, because you have to get it from people, right? So in that case, you will be uh, making use of the social rules and you'll be making use of the investigation rules specifically. So uh, when we drill down, it kind of informs us as to what, mechanics to use right 
You know, uh, I'm just real quick, just so if uh, folks are following along, um, we're looking at the uh, Modern Age Basic Core Rulebook on page 174, The Adventure, A Speculative, a speculative Venture. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great. I'm just checking out uh, the characters and just sort of the the setting. Like I could I could see playing this definitely. This is uh, it's got a vibe to it, sort of yeah, a, almost like got, a James Bondy kind of feel. We've got a couple of adventures where what's dominant. A speculative adventure is one, and Warflower is another. Where mm. um, we have multiple options for what the like revelation truth premise is, right? But the structure of the adventure is the same regardless of what it is. So okay, now that's interesting. Um, so uh, it, there's some interesting. You know, we've got a couple folks in here, like uh, Jeremiah was saying, uh, they're going to be taking a uh, uh, sort of a one shot writing uh, RPG mm -hmm. kind of a, a class or a course, and um, uh, one to talk about encounter design mainly, and uh, that you know they're familiar with the rules of uh, uh, you know as it relates to encounter design, but less so in age, um, how it's pretty easy. It feels like that's a very, uh, um, a streamlined economic sort of, um, uh, a trick of like switch out the endings and, you know, you still have the basic structure and yeah. you can hang a bunch of stuff on that and, and just swap out the ending or adjust some of the key features and you got a different adventure. Mm -hmm. Um, to answer Craig's question, um, Age and Mutes and Masterminds are different games. Um, however, there are some points where I think you could use one to inspire the other. I mean, certainly um, Crystal has written about using stunts in m and uh, And I know that we do have some rules for powers, um, which means that some superhero type stuff is possible using modern age it's not our main focus because we have a whole other game called mutes and masterminds that is devoted to doing supers so you know the question is is they're not designed to work together but you can make them work with a little cleverness um as for oh i've lost my train of thought because I was answering that question. <laughs> no oh, worries. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, designing an encounter. Okay, well, there are basically two ways. There are two, well, there are two poles for encounter design. And one is narrative in focus. And the other one is statistical in focus, right? So mm -hmm. for a game like Dungeons and Dragons, where you have challenge rating, um, you do have a heavier statistical focus. Although in 5th edition, it's not quite as gear-headed as it was in third. Um, and I think part of that was one of the things that always happened in uh, third edition D&D &D is, um, is that a lot of the time the challenge ratings just didn't really, weren't really reflective of how tough the encounter was um, because they were, how do I put this? Um, Every once in a while, you'll you'll have a creature that has like a monster, for example, um, that has a single really cool trick. And um, but the thing is, if the players never engage with that trick, right, um, or they unwittingly or intentionally work their way around it, uh, like Mummy Rod is one of those things, right? Um, where you know, if you are careful about avoiding Mummy Rot in D and D then mummies get much less interesting and scary a lot of the time. It depends on the rules you're using, right? So that's the statistical approach. And the other approach is, you know, what, in this, what would logically happen in the story, right? Or what would be interesting from a story perspective, regardless of the game statistics, right? And, you know, a lot of the time, those kinds of encounters can be very weak or very strong or just right but really what it depends you know what sets the encounter in terms of its difficulty is what the story says would be there right so uh, so that can be a bit of a mixed bag so in uh, age we generally take a middle of the road approach and um, and that's through the use of our threats 
for creatures. Um, that's one example of it, right? So for um, creatures, we have a we have uh, threat ratings: uh, minor, moderate, major, dire, and epic. Do I remember right? I do develop this damn game. So, <laughs> um, and those have kind of a preferential level range, right? So, and that's generally in splits of four. And a typical encounter um, should be characters in that level. A group of characters in that level range will find it interesting to tangle with an antagonist um, who has that matching rating. So for a minor encounter, right? That should be an okay thing for first level to fourth level characters to run into. Um, you know, a more challenging encounter would be to be one threat up. Um, although it'll be pretty tough at lower levels. And then at two threats up, then you've got something that is, you know, you really... <laughs> you really don't want to inflict that on them unless it is a big important thing or it's truly awful consequences for having made some kind of mistake with story importance right so gotcha. you know so if you're playing like a bunch of second level characters then you know uh your bread and butter combat encounter would be a minor encounter um uh, and a tough finale one might be a moderate one and a um you bit off more than you can chew but maybe it would be interesting to see how you die or escape uh, sure. <laughs> maybe maybe even prevail that would be major and that's, right. kind of the, that's kind of the scaling the rough scaling that we use um now yeah. mode in modern age also influences exactly how at least for violence and combat purposes, how much tougher encounters get um, because player characters in cinematic mode, right? They get, uh, you know, they get health at a pretty fair clip. So naturally when you have um, an antagonist who's in that mode, they have comparable health, right? Um, whereas in gritty and pulpy, uh, there aren't those increases in toughness. So you can be a little looser with um, with what how you use those uh, those threat ratings. So that uh, really the uh, more it's weird because kind of the more realistic your mode, right? The less high powered your mode, the more story oriented really the encounter design goes. So here's a question. Um, as you're developing your your design and, and, you know, let's say you get to a point where you kind of want to get some players ready to go and they've never played Age. They're, they're, they've never played Modern Age and there's kind of get what's the what's the way to sort of onboard them in a session zero? Like what are some of the things you would do to kind of work people in? Well, you want to have a session zero where they're making characters. Um, um, could, yeah, could be. I mean, yeah. Um, well, then then you want to have that. Then you want to have that setting. You want to have that setting and you want the setting to have, um, you know, core motifs, right? Like things you see, hear, feel, experience. Um, you want to have that center. You want to have an idea of a central conflict or a central wellspring of conflict, um, you know, like that Cold War thing. Or in a cyberpunk game, you know, you typically have, um, you know, corporate malfeasance, um, <laughs> right? And uh, lastly, uh, you want to use those two things combined to tell the players what their characters, potential characters would be like and what they would do, right? Because if I'm running a cyberpunk game and I know that the main thing is to, you know, um, take down this powerful corrupt corporation, from the inside, right? So that becomes a kind of cyberpunk industrial esp espionage game. Um, I know a couple of things, right? I know there's going to be a lot of emphasis on, you know, secret agendas and corporate mm -hmm. branding and things like that. Uh, and I know that the central conflict is going to be with this corporation and it's going to take a bunch of different forms. So what I can say 
is, you know, um, I can go, you know, uh, make your characters, but they are related to this. Um, they're related to this setting and this conflict. And so ask, so you ask them like, why, why is your character run up against evil corporation? I like it. Right. And, and why are they taking action? Because remember also in modern age, we have drives. You cannot make a character who doesn't want to go on an adventure. <laughs> it's against the rules. I like that. So, <laughs> um, so you look, you might look at your drive and say, well, I'm motivated by this and it connects to this thing. And that's why I'm doing it. Right. I like that. And uh, also a great time to sort of get the players to determine in some fashion, you know, how they are connected and why they're all there in that space together. And that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, of course you want to, you want to kind of set up their relationships with each other too. And that's a core step in modern age. Love is, that. It's the goals and ties step. Right. And sometimes it can be reinforced with relationships using the relationship rules, but it doesn't always have to be. Um, Remember, a relationship isn't there to measure every single social tie you have. It's just the ones that have dramatic punctuation. And this is something else I want to kind of make clear, too, is that modern age doesn't simulate competency. Um, so it's, what it does is the game statistics reflect how good your character is at doing things in dramatic situations, right? So uh, one of the things that we have is the average person in modern age, sometimes we call them a zero, and that's because they have zero in every ability. And they have, you know, uh, they have 10 defense and uh, 10 health and uh, speed of 10, right? And uh, they might have one or two things they're good at that you would give them a focus bonus for, if you liked. Right. But the thing is, is that people kind of assume a lot of the time that a zero is like some just somebody who's not who wouldn't be worthy of your respect in real life. Right. That there's some kind of idiot and that modern age is implying that the average person is an idiot. Right. Because they're zero they They have average zero and everything. And player character heroes are tougher. But that's not the case. Um, really what you have to do is understand that the abilities and other traits in modern age represent your character's, um, competencies in situations that we, we think are worth telling stories about, right? So you can have someone who's a zero, uh, who's an NPC, um, who is an expert on some subject that the, the, the characters need to consult about, right? And when it's not something dramatic, right? You just have them know whatever they know, right? Uh, because I find that a lot of the time people think that they have to make a super impressive NPC in order to justify having the knowledge that the PCs want, right? They have to make sure that they have like some kind of expertise, talent, and this and that and the other thing. But if functionally they exist in the story just to give you a piece of information, you don't need to give them further game statistics. So that gotcha. just uh, streamlines things. However, you know, that same person, um, you know, they're going to choke in a crisis, right? And that's when the PCs need to step in. So one example, I guess, would be um, you can have someone who is... Um, an expert, uh, an expert chemist, right? An expert chemist who knows everything there is to know about making explosives, making and neutralizing explosives, right? And but they can still be a zero. They can still have be a basic NPC with zero and everything. Um, and they can certainly, you know, help other help the PCs out with information. The thing is, if you put them in front of a bomb, they would choke and the bomb would blow up and everybody would die. And that's yeah, why, know. and that's why PCs are heroes, um, is that they have these, they have the ability to push it out in dramatic situations, and they have a drive which inclines them to get into trouble. So 
if you lean on those two things, making the rest of the world with an understanding that the PCs are good at dangerous or dramatic situations, um, they're better than normal people. They rise to the occasion and they're compelled to get into them, right? Because the one thing that I really want to short circuit is the idea that a bunch of players show up and you kind of have to do a little puppet show to convince them to get involved, right? Right, right. My opinion is that in kind of session zero, what you should be doing is uh, you should be seeing if the players are interested in this kind of game, right? So I say, you know, I want to... Um, I want to run this cyberpunk game. Uh, I picked up cyberpunk slice and I want to use it stuff and I want to make it a game of corporate conflict. And how do you feel about that? Right. Um, I'm not having a conversation with the players about like why they're the character they made should care. Right. Because it is axiomatic that they care. Right. If you are making a character for this game, your character has to care. So, um but the first thing of course is you want to make sure that the players are actually interested in what you want to run and if they're interested um then you kind of go all right well go nuts you make characters who are committed to participating in that right uh i find what gets what happens a lot of the time is kind of the other way around where you have people who they may be interested in the motifs and stuff but they have a character they kind of want to play regardless of what the setting is mm. and then you kind of have to find a way to yank them into the setting um and then yank them into going on adventures um and uh, i think that uh that it shouldn't have that approach however i am a hypocrite and i'll tell you why <laughs> i am currently playing in a modern age game which totally goes on the basis of we each of us made up a character and um, without any particular rhyme or reason with the loose idea that we're playing in a, you know, uh, magic has returned fantasy cyberpunk kind of game. Um, and, uh, but in that case, uh, really, I think it was our GM, um, I'm not running it, uh, didn't have a good idea of a setting and wanted to, take the characters we made and sort of build something around them that would work. Right. How fun. Right. With a very loose set of things. So certainly that approach can also work. It's just not the default approach I favor for modern age. And also maybe um, like a more advanced approach, right? I mean, are these, yeah, some well, been, yeah, yeah. Even at that, you have to be willing to give a little, right? Because yeah. you can't like, one of the tricky things um, is when people start to play RPGs, uh, because they are used to dealing with linear storytelling, or at the very least, uh, heavily constrained structured storytelling, which they have learned through books, films, television shows, and video games. Um, they tend to construct those stories for themselves before they even start, right? So... You know, I make my, um, you know, I make my cool uh, fighting character, right? And I have these ideas for all these fights I'm going to get into and how I'm going to relate to the other characters and all this stuff. I have it all planned ahead, right? And then it'll just, it'll, I get frustrated and it all falls apart because, of course, I haven't shared any of this with the GM. Mm -hmm. or the other players and uh and when they don't do when they don't read my mind and do what i wanted them to do without ever telling them right i get annoyed right even though i shouldn't get annoyed right and it, i think it kind of reaches its apex in i don't know if uh and i've mentioned this before i think on other streams um is has anybody ever read those kind of uh forum and facebook community posts and discord posts and things like that where someone says i'm playing such and such in such and such a game and uh i want to do this how do i go about doing it 
Um, and I think the GM doesn't want me to do it, and the other players don't know I want to. And that seems <laughs> like bad. It does seem counterproductive <laughs> to the whole notion of cooperative play around a table. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, if you want something, ask for it. Yeah. There's no rule. There's no rule that says you can't say, you know, I, uh, you know, I want to have a spooky encounter with a ghost in this game. Right. Uh, you know, it's all right just to ask for that instead of like passive aggressively going, I'm going to research ghosts. Why are you going to research ghosts? I'm just going to do it. I am oh, so I hope curious. A ghost isn't going to come and get us. Like, do that. Um, you know, uh, Nate, Nate brings up something good. You know, self awareness is only good for you. Group awareness, <laughs> <with> everyone. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's it exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. You have to. Have, you have to have that open communication. When I say open communication, people often think that you know uh, we're all going to pass us pass a stick around and talk about our feelings but often there's a lot more utility to it because you just say what you want right yeah yeah you don't want to attach any values to it um you don't say like my thing would be the best thing and your idea sucks you just say you know i'd love to do this kind of thing sometime and then the gm and the rest of the group have that data point right i yeah. think this is especially important and this is something that we talk about in um, in the mastery guide uh, is uh, is especially having those open conversations when there's going to be um, an encounter or scene or whatever you want to call it um, that involves uh, kind of uh, character versus character conflict, right? Um, because again, there's nothing wrong with talking to the buddy you're playing with and saying, I'd really like to start a storyline where I have a beef with you over something, right? Uh, and my experience is that doing that consciously is way better than spontaneously having an in-character argument that you don't know the boundaries of, right? If you end up having an in-character argument that you don't know the boundaries of, then that's why when you have a conversation and in that conversation, that is out of character, you do two things. The first is that you affirm that this is purely an in-character conflict that has nothing to do with you, the genuine people. Okay, very second. important, because that just <laughs> keeps things around the table, like, like let's let's divorce our personal thing from, and unless, you know, there's a conflict, and then you work it out, but yeah. That's well, really, yeah, really sometimes well there is a, sometimes there is a genuine conflict, right? But that's, that's not what I'm talking about. That's right, right yeah. Um, I'm not talking about anybody being offensive. I'm talking about, you know, um, people having an argument about how to deal with a ghost. <laughs> right, character, right. Right. And then, you know, what should happen is someone should step out and, uh, out of character and talk frankly about their character's motives and, and aims and really define it as an in-character conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And talking about motives and aims too means that you can have a much tighter expression of character conflict because what happens most often is uh, you have people argue in character and then it just kind of dwindles and doesn't go into any particular direction, right? Which you will notice the opposite of what you like to read about or see in other media, right? Like you don't have generally when two characters have a conflict two things have to happen for it in you know in a, in entertainment media two things have to happen for it to be worthwhile um it has to end with a resolution or it has to end with an escalation right so if it ends with a resolution then yeah you know you have that arc and it's done if it's an escalation then what that means is that you know uh we haven't finished this it's going to become more important Right. Yeah. Um, either emotionally or to the story or all of those things. And it's perfectly fine to say, well, we haven't gone to this. Let's like, how do we escalate this to make it more fun? Right. And then you get the GM in on it and the GM can, can kind of think about it and think of elements that they can introduce that nobody else can introduce to it. Right. Um, like NPCs who are getting involved and things like that. 
So in this ghost scenario, for example, right? Um, if you have, you know, if I who want to deal with the ghost with an exorcism are, um, you know, arguing with the person who wants to do like a tactical entry with uh, blessed shotgun shells, right? Yeah. Um, you know, our argument should, after affirming that this is an in-character argument, it should either end with a decision to do one thing or another, or um, there should be a frank conversation about how uh, we're going to nurture this as a conflict, right? And then, meanwhile, what the GM can do is the GM can uh, maybe if there is maybe uh, if there's no resolution, then call the Ghostbusters or <laughs> <laughs> or what the GM can do is the GM can secretly decide that a third approach where the characters have to cooperate is the best approach. Right, right. Or, yeah, introduce complicating elements that really makes, that raises the stakes for the players. And, yeah. I mean, yeah, so that can be a lot of fun and add the texture yeah. and stuff. I, I wonder, too, you know, as we're talking about, uh, I know this is maybe a few steps ahead of the game, but um, Nate asks something that I'm really curious about. When you are in, you're coordinating your adventure, you're designing it even, um, uh, you know, I've heard varying sort of approaches to this, but there's always the when the party splits, mm -hmm. people have to do three different things. Um, uh, you know, how what what do you think about that generally, and uh, and how would you address it? Yeah, yeah. Like how um, how does that uh, look in gameplay? Well, I mean, how it normally looks is well, there's it's. I'm not going to get particularly innovative here. Um, <laughs> you know. You go over here, you go over here, and then we go back and forth, right? Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, the main Will there ever be an occasion where somebody has to literally, like, you need to step out of the room because you can't hear this, or is that rare? You know, you know I, I generally trust people not like, – I generally trust people with that, that kind of information. Okay. Especially in, like, contemporary modern games because – you just kind of, there are so many ways people can communicate with each other. And there's so much stuff that happens in that. There's so many interactions that characters would logically have um, that don't come up in play that, you know, what I'll normally do is I'll say, you know, uh, does any of you have any reason not to share information? No. All right, then we'll just assume you all told each other about it after. Nice. Okay. I like that. <laughs> or during, yeah. right? It's that simple. Or sometimes, too, you know, you say just, well, don't let that information influence your actions, right? Because, you know, what sucks is like uh, part of the joy of role playing, of course, is being an audience member as well as a participant. So if I go, you know, go sit over there where you get to have no fun. Right. Well, yeah. Have fun, and you don't even get to see the fun they're having. Well, eh, that's not that's fun. Not, I mean, now there, the, you know, Owen Casey Stevens um, had mentioned in the past, like you know, an approach to dealing with that splitting of the party, depending on how elaborate the experience is. Um, you could even have one of the people who aren't there, but there, you know, around the table, play like an NPC or you oh, know, yeah, have, have a part in that. Yeah. You sure can do that. Um, like we have, you know, we do have rules for NPC companions um, in modern age, right? Which are kind of bootstrapped. It's they're in the companion. They're kind of bootstrapped off of similar rules in Blue Rose, right? Yeah. So certainly I can go, well, now you're playing this, you know, um, and you have this perspective. I actually have kind of this dream campaign that works like that most of the time. Right. This is my. I have this dream of running a game using a cast of thousands model. Right. Okay. And this was uh, after I saw. Has anybody ever seen the Thin Red Line, the Terrence Malick movie? I've not seen it. Because I am getting that uh, pretentious. I am going to <laughs> cite a Terrence Malick film when talking about running. We'd expect uh, no less, sir. Okay. So, okay, so one of the things in Thin Red Line that's kind of neat is that you have these name actors 
who show up um, and because they're named actors, you have a reflex as an audience member to immediately consider them a protagonist, right? Yeah. Except that they'll appear and then they'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's interesting because in the context of the movie, because I think that happens, like there's a character played by Bruce Willis who's there and then like not really there because the main character is really uh, the fellow played by is it Adrian Brody. I think it's Adrian Brody. Anyway, not the most not the most important part of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the main thing is that, you know, um, it kind of makes you wonder like, well, what was Bruce Willis's character doing before we saw him? Right. Um, and, and what is he going to do after? And uh, so my dream is sort of to run a campaign that has an epic scope and has a decentralized approach uh, to player characters. So the idea is that, you know, for part of the story, you're going to be playing this set of characters. And then for another part of the story, you're going to be playing a different set of characters. And the important thing isn't playing your guy. The important thing is telling a story. Uh, yeah, yeah. Through these, through these different protagonists. And I thought of some of the things you would need. You need streamlined character creation for that, right? Um, I think in my dream iteration... Uh, like in the mastery guide, we have some rules for streamlined characters and part, and we do mention this model of play, right. Um, with the idea that you can produce these characters and go, well, now you're playing these, right. Um, and certainly in horror games, there's been a tradition, uh, where you, uh, might play a bunch of easy to make characters who are the victims of the monster. Ah, yeah, or yeah. Flash or whatever. Um, and then you play the PCs who deal with it. Wow, yeah. You know, this is really brilliant. And what I like about this is when you're talking about, um, you know, many people come to modern age from varying degrees of understanding and experience, uh, either as a, you know, as a GM or as a player. And this is really sort of, a, I could imagine seeing sort of a marathon of this and just kind of watching to see how people kind of, adapt and develop and sort of you know build capacity to be these other characters it it's very interesting it definitely also puts a a little bit of a more importance on the role playing aspect like yeah. you just yeah that's super fun I, I really like that idea um let me see here real quick i just want to look it says uh, brian uh f irving shares that uh, that he's done something a bit like that mm -hmm. in their post-apocalyptic yeah. okay, modern so what game. brian's talking about is something called troop play um and troop play has an illustrious history because it comes to us through a game called Ars Magica, um, which uh, two thirds of the ownership team are super fans of. Um, and in Ars, uh, that was a fantasy game. It is a fantasy game where you play a wizard, but as a wizard, you are powerful like Merlin. You're not not powerful like a first edition a first edition AD and D magic user with one spell. You are just legitimately better than everybody else. Um, so the way ours play works is that one person plays their wizard, and then everybody else plays uh, secondary characters, right? Either they play companions who are generally um, characters who, uh, you know, they're not as cool as wizards, uh, but they have special skills that are helpful. Or you play uh, Kustos or Grogs, hey man, who are your one note fighter types, right? Um, so it creates a nice varied thing. And then after you go through a story with that wizard, um, then the next person gets to play their wizard and everybody else plays the secondary characters around that. Fun, yeah. You know, uh, Nicole Andrews, of course, being the uh, a fraction of the of the two thirds of ownership who love uh, Ars Magica says, uh, mm -hmm. I could go on all day about how great it oh, is. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well. Wow. Well, her name is in the copy of second edition ours that I have. Right. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. So she she has a she knows the the deep the deep magic. Of, yeah, absolutely. Of play yeah. And ours and and all. I'm not sure but, people know this, but you know Nicole has has really only worked in tabletop. Like that's been her her career arc. Um, you know, except you know she had a, a small mm -hmm. stint in Hollywood. Um, but she just 
just couldn't uh she just didn't want to deal with the with the fame um mm -hmm. she was yeah yeah uh so instead she brought her fame and you know uh personality mm -hmm. and and uh uh skill to tabletop and you know and here she has reigned so um and Nate says jelly um yeah love that and then um so okay well here's the thing as per the norm uh we get into these conversations and we then suddenly run out of time. <laughs> We've got about 15 minutes left. So I want to kind of drive us back to the some practical things. Um, so we've kind of talked about creating this setting. We've talked about onboarding players and getting them and sort of the mechanics of, of interaction that you can kind of anticipate. What are some of the things in the development of this, of, you know, of your story arc um, and your tabletop experience? What should you be thinking about? Um. I guess you want to have something that feels like a like again uh, not the most innovative insight, but you know it want you need it to be meaningful on a couple of levels, right? Um, the easiest part to get meaningful is just overcoming a challenge, right? And that's interacting with the rules um, in a very gamey competitive way right assuming that the encounter has to do with a conflict which it often does um, sure <laughs> right so that's so easy to do that as long as you don't make things too tough um or too easy you're fine there right yeah uh, in addition however it there needs to be a sense that you had a memorable interesting experience um and yes, backstory integration can be mm. part of it. It says Nate, yep, yep. Character. And then there has to be uh, a collective experience too, right? Um, so typically what that means is in the context of an encounter, uh, everybody needs something to do that is for them to do, right? Uh, and they don't each need necessarily a unique thing, um, right? Not everybody has to be the best uh at every encounter there is room for you know step aside we know how to use the guns or step aside mm -hmm. we know how to use the dewey decimal system um <laughs> or, or, I'll, I'll this immediately yeah yeah yes uh or whatever it is but there needs to be a sense of participation um that is distinct that your character did something cool right and there also has to be a sense that it wasn't uh one of an easily interchangeable set of encounters. And I find for the latter to make encounters distinct, uh, it's the material elements of it, the stuff that you imagine, or at least the material elements that you imagine that are the big things, right? I think uh, a lot of people want to hit those emotional buttons, um, but you hit those emotional buttons by having things that can actually be described materially. So um, in a fight, uh, usually the environment, like, you know, the antagonist is always a big deal, but it's easy to say, you know, make an interesting antagonist. Uh, yeah. What's harder is, is to make it tactically interesting and environmentally interesting. So tactically interesting means that you have to do something more than whittle down their health, right? Or to right. do that, you need to do something special. Um, and environmentally interesting means things are happening in a place that matters. Um, that do that doesn't just matter because it's log a logical place for a conflict to occur, but because it influences the nature of the conflict itself, right? And that could be something as simple as somebody who is, you know, you have to deal with who is standing on a pyramid of crates, right? Okay. It sounds like the dumbest thing, but uh, if you, but people will remember having to have like a stupid fight where they had to crawl up a pyramid of crates. They really will. Uh, okay, I oh, gotcha. I gotcha. So yeah, I know that. Uh, like one one thing in the game that I ran, uh, and this is an age. It was actually the uh, Star Wars. Um, it was the Star Wars Saga RPG. And when I was running that, uh, I ran it in kind of an alternate Star Wars um, where, you know, Vader captured Luke and Leia. And the this version of the Death Star was filled uh, with their zombie clones. Um, and nice. 
the PCs were going to infiltrate this, this Death Star. And I decided that the only way for them to get down there was to go down this big central shaft. So, and then the Luke and Leia clone zombies came out after them. So the thing that they really loved was the fact that they had to fight on a vertical surface. Okay, yeah. While yeah. repelling, right? So they had to fight zombies while repelling. Um and, Interesting. Uh, Some a, a change that you know really small in the sort of this the you're just like imagining a different sort of you know sort of uh, yeah. uh, verticality is it, it really does sort of reset the palette a little bit so people have to think about things in a different way and really immerse themselves. Um, you know, I. I we are uh, about you know, we have ten minutes, and Jeremiah asks a really yeah. interesting question, and that is, if you're writing something for general use, um, for like for publication, you're going to publish something. Um, maybe you're going to do that through the H Creators Alliance over at uh, Drive Through RPG. Uh, uh, hold on, uh, how, how do you you know how do you give a good, interesting encounter or adventure when you don't know the characters that will be playing it? Um, in that case. Uh... Well, there are always some things that are universal, and that's kind of what the channels of play in modern age are for, right? Action, mm. action, exploration, and social. So if we look at those three things, they can kind of be seen as a checklist of things to emphasize in an adventure. So action usually refers to um, conflict in a physical space, right? So uh, chases, fights, that kind of thing. Chases, fights, explosions. Um, you know, exploration that's information and an interesting environment right um and you know so information and hazards are a big part of that and social is npcs um is that is npcs and information or tasks that only these npcs can do for you right so if you use those three elements um to focus yourself it's it's kind of really hard to go wrong. Um, it's not as if every encounter has to have all three elements. And in fact, sometimes we do list encounters as having a singular focus. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you hit all those bases, normally that it works out pretty well. Uh, and the last and the other thing is to make things sensorily vivid. And this is something I, I've talked about before. Mm. In that uh, you should know what things look like. And conversely, you should not emphasize things that are uninteresting and you should not give people a hard time over them. The classic one um, that has often come up in games that I've been in is if in a modern setting, I can get some kind of trivial service, right? That won't make a huge difference um, or even helps with what the GM's agenda is. So the class, the super classic one I can think of is, can I get a cab there? Right. Right. And I will, and I have often seen when this question comes up, just GMs waste tons of time trying to figure this out and, you know, having the character call the cab and seeing if they can like add some sort of complication to it or something. Or go, oh, you know, you're in an industrial park. It'll take forever. And it doesn't matter because these are in scenarios often where the GM, like, wants the PCs to go somewhere. So why are you stopping them from doing it? Right? Right. Create that speed bump. And uh, when you're writing, what you do is you provide those assurances to tell, to signal to the GM what's important. So, um, for example, uh if uh, if there's a question of what equipment is necessary and whether that equipment is important, um, the adventure should say, you can get this, this, and this, right? Um, and anything else will require resources roles, and these things you can't get. So you shape those expectations immediately, and you shape them for the GM, and the GM can in turn shape them for the players. I like that, you know, and so, you know, and, um, and and also to layer that, if you're creating an adventure, is it a good idea to then, as part of the published works, to to maybe bake in some pregens or, you know, like that kind of uh, recipe for just easy pickup? Like, let's say you're you're, yeah, you're playing something. Yeah, at a but I really hate making pre-generated characters, so let's say no. 
<laughs> gotcha. Yes, but no. So yeah, uh, you, you, yeah. The, no, the, no. I mean, of course, it's always a good idea to have pre-generated characters, um, because pre-generated characters are because characters are they take some time to make. So if you yeah. do that work, then uh, then that's golden. Um, NPCs are a bit different because just remember that in modern age, you don't need to use the rules for PCs to make NPCs. You can just make stuff up for NPCs if you want. Nice. Right. Um, because again, it's not, um, a life simulator. Character right. Person, right. Um, we have a set of tools that we use to get statistics and abilities and talents and things that are designed to support um a heroic character gradually becoming more heroic right um right. The protagonist getting more experience and those things are not necessary for npcs because we don't care about um metering out their progress i like we that she care about their function <laughs> i i really love this uh i had an npc um that was an uh, an adventure chef <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very top chefy. Um, this is great. Uh, so we are um, uh, coming to the end of uh, our Thursday age today. So, you know, in, you've given out tons of great advice and, you know, um, uh, talking everything from the GM's relationship with the players and the character, uh, the characters that the players are playing and their relationships with themselves. You've talked about all that in the context of modern age and what that what the adventure game engine offers to kind of help guide that process. My question then is, when you look at sort of, when you step back and you just think about the, the tools that GMs develop just internally and the, the ideas that they kind of need to come to the table with to prepare for the best, you know, extended sessions, um, what's, what is your, uh, advice or, you know, sort of your, your maxims for success? Like, you know, that kind of a, that kind of a thing, like what are the core things that a GM should prepare themselves at, or, and, and, and kind of develop to be better at their craft? Again, it's being, again, I think clear communication is the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and knowing when to talk through the veil of being the GM and holding back certain information and presenting a front of the fictional environment and the people the PCs make and when to pull back, right? So, you know, often I will say in games I run, when somebody has a question about a thing, like, I don't care, what do you think, right? And that can be, you know, what are the headlines in the newspaper? I don't care. What do you think? Right. What would be interesting for you? Um, right, right. And we can work well, and on that together, right? Right, and that's an important difference. It's not like, you know, not sort of this uh, um, nihilistic, I don't care. But it's like, a, yeah, you know, like what is, yeah, you you help me get there. I and love that. And the other thing, me. too, is to make it clear from the beginning for the players and to vigorously exercise the fact that as GM, you have the right to peer into the minds, hearts, and souls of their characters. Their characters cannot have any secrets from you. Gotcha. Uh, and it seems like that should be common sense. Um, but sometimes, again, you know, looking back at some of this stuff, you have uh, people who are keeping things from the GM, right? And yeah. that's pointless. Um, if you think that there's some sort of, the, uh, if you're doing it to avoid a conflict, well, then it's better to resolve a conflict by talking about it. But the purpose for everything in your character is to inform cooperative play. Right, right, yeah. And the GM has the right to know all of those things. That's right, and they need to, to be able to kind of craft the world and the story to the benefit of all. And the other the other thing that I wanted to mention, too, is that the, the notion that players are kind of keeping a thing from somebody um you know if you l kind of just let that piece go away and then you engage in the story it, those moments and developments and surprises will happen you know you mm -hmm. can just you know embrace them in the context of the story but listen we've got to let you go malcolm thank you so much for hanging out with us today i really appreciate it uh you're gonna go do some some sword fighting yes right? yes nice. i have a fencing class in fencing class 
10 minutes. So. 10 minutes. Well, then we will let you go. Hey, I want to thank everybody in the chat. This has been um, uh, a great conversation. We'll continue this conversation throughout the next um, a few Thursdays, and, and um, we'll invite Malcolm back for sure. And we will go get a uh, somebody who can help Nicole, who is secretly possessed by a ghost, um, which, you know, um, fun. All right, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Yep. See you. Bye.